Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. We are here for a conversation with Dottie Morris, who is the uh, Chief Officer for Diversity and Multiculturalism at our sister institution of Keene State. Um, before we get started with Dottie, uh, who I am so pleased to have, I wanted to say one thing, which is that many of you are either involved with or familiar with um, the Chief Diversity Officer search that is currently going on at Plymouth State. That's really um, in some ways what we're talking about here is how we can support this new position. Um, I am on the search committee for that. So I thought it was especially important that I stress that this event and that search are not tied together in any way. Um, actually, we talked about doing this, I think, before they even put me on that search committee. Um, so this is not part of the search process. Uh, this is a whole separate thing. Really what we're talking about is once we hire somebody um, for this role, uh, what could we be doing as a campus to get ready for that position, to work with that position? We're talking about giving that um, position the best chance of success. So this really is a separate thing from the actual search process, which Dottie, of course, is not involved with in any way. Um, then the last thing I want to say by way of introduction of um, my friend Dottie, who we are so lucky to have in, in the system, um, is that some of you attended our, our panel, I don't know, I think it was this year, I really, really don't even, I think it's Christmas because I have a tree in my house, um, but we had a panel on the divisive concepts legislation, um, which some of you are aware of. Dottie may talk a little bit about some of that stuff today. Um, that's the legislation that um, passed in New Hampshire uh, as part of the budget the budget bill um, that says you really, depending on who you are, you have to stay away from divisive concepts, which include things like systemic racism um, in, in education. Um, so we had a panel and Dottie was one of the folks along with people from the ACLU and faculty members um, who, who were, was on that panel with the collab. And I will tell you that once that panel finished, I got a, a literal flood of emails from people saying, when can you bring Dottie back? Some people said, can you find some way to hire Dottie and steal her from Keene State? Um, that is above my pay grade, I'm sorry to say. But uh, if you don't know Dottie, I think um, even beyond the specifics of the content that she shares today, she's just a great asset to our system and somebody that you want to know um, because she has a, a really nice take, I think, on uh, yes, diversity and multiculturalism, but particularly what it means for our university system and for our state. Um, so uh, Dottie was on the uh, governor's commission, one of the folks who resigned um, in protest during that um, divisive concepts um, uh, issue that, that happened. So anyway, she's really a, a, an important person right now uh, for the state of New Hampshire. And I'm really glad that she made time in her schedule to be here. So I am going to toss it over to Dottie. Um, Martha and I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, um, you can pop them in there anytime. And we'll probably be a small enough group that we'll just do unmuting and, and asking questions here and there. Um, Dottie will pause. So we look forward to hearing what you guys have to say um, and what questions you have for Dottie. So with that, Dottie Morris. Good afternoon. And wow, I, I don't even know what to say after, after that. Uh, I hope I live up to that hype, you know, um, but thank you very much. Um, what I am going to do today is I'm gonna put slides up and take them down, put them up, take them down, put them up so we can see each other. It's a little hard to see each other with the, um, with the slides up. So I, I'm about to share, and I always have to do this. Can you see my screen, my share? So um, one thing um, I, I cannot not do, um, I do this at the start of classes. Uh, I teach a couple of classes here. I was trained as a clinical psychologist. Uh, and so I teach some classes in the psych department. I have uh, uh, been teaching this one course called Culture and Psychology for I don't know how long now. Um, for 20 some years, but I think that if we're going to have any 
conversation um, um, on any land in North America, we have to, I feel like uh, there's a must to acknowledge uh, uh, the land that we're on, to acknowledge the impact of this occupation um, that some people don't wanna go to Florida to say that, but I am willing to say that. And to understand the implications as we move forward uh, of some of the things that are happening to prevent this kind of information to be revealed. So I think it's very important um, for those of us who can speak to continue to uh, lay these things out because it's our responsibility to let uh, this kind of information be known. So uh, I always uh, like to do this, not just as uh, something that you just do because it's performative, but mainly I always wanna start everything with uh, this understanding of, I understand the space that I'm in, I understand the place that I, I'm on, the land that I'm on, and I understand the meaning uh, that it had for the first peoples here. Uh, and so that influences everything that, that I know that I do, and I hope that we can do together. So I want to start off, uh, since we're talking about chief diversity officers, uh, just uh, to acknowledge someone who was very helpful to me when I took this position um, several years ago. Uh, Wanda Mitchell was the chief diversity officer at a University of New Hampshire at the time that I took on the position. And within uh, the first week of me taking the position, um, I uh, drove to Durham and spent the day with her. And uh, she really did impart a lot of really good information uh, that I needed to be able to do the work that I did. Uh, she gave me a lot of cautionary um, um, information. She uh, encouraged me to do certain things. And throughout the time that she was at, at UNH, um, and, and I took this job, we worked together on several projects. And um, she left UNH and went down to Virginia and was there probably, you know, about three or four years uh, before she, she died. And so uh, I can't talk about chief diversity officers and the, the evolution of chief diversity officers in the state of New Hampshire uh, without mentioning uh, Dr. Mitchell. So I just wanted to let you all um, know that that's part of that important piece of staying connected to uh, understanding the roots and, and the shoulders that we stand on because I definitely uh, feel as though I stand on um, Wanda's shoulders. And so some of the things that I'll talk about today are basically as a result of, of talking to her and us trying to figure things out and us doing presentations together. And even um, the greatest part about this, places where we disagreed. <laughs> and I think that that particular belief system that disagreement or making people uncomfortable uh, because you make a point. And I think that uh, we're so afraid of that. It seems like that's kind of triggering so many um, situations that won't allow us to have some true connections with each other. So uh, we didn't agree on everything and, and we love that we didn't agree on everything. So I uh, just wanted to put her out there. I just have a, a bunch of questions here uh, that, that I, and again, I'll send these to Robin, but these are some questions I, I, I would want you to think about uh, over the course of time until, you know, even when the chief diversity officer comes, these are kinds of, things that you want to think of, what kind of university you want to have and how does this position um, help to co-create that university? What happens sometimes if you bring a chief diversity officer in, as in my case, I was brought in in uh, 2007. So I've been here forever in 2007. And I came in as an interim uh, person before they uh, did a national search, before a national search was done. And then I uh, secured the job at that point. Uh, so this whole idea of where does the position fall when you didn't have it, because I'm the inaugural person as your person will be the inaugural person. So what will happen is that there were people who are already doing the work. They were already engaged in the work. And so then where did I fall within the work that was being done? And uh, so it took some dancing and some figuring out uh, how this position fits because I don't think um, to be 
honest with you, as opposed to being dishonest as I am most of the time. But you know, to be honest with you, I don't think they had thought it through. And so I think that thinking through where will this position, not organizationally, because that's not the issue, not who the person reports to, and but 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 how does it fit? The position fits in or helps to shape uh, where you go. So that's why. And so, what are some th key things you think the person will need? Um, what are some institutional structures that are in place that will support it? And what are some things you need to put in place? Uh, how ready? And then, what kind of change? Because sometimes we think we're ready for change, but we just we just want some minor things. So you, as an institution or as individuals, you have to think about that. And then the big one is it has to do with underlining principles that you want to base the work on. And I'm sure whoever will take the position. This is one of the first things they will want to kind of struggle with because it's because it's connected to me uh, with uh, the readiness and it's connected with what you know kinds of things you want to do because with each one of these ways if you think about the principle it will shape the work because diversity lends itself to a different type of outcome if you're thinking about okay we're going to base it in the principles of diversity. It will be different than if you did, you put it in the um, in, in, in inclusion or equity or social justice and for goodness sake, anti-racism or anti-oppression. Um, or there might be something else. So that's why I'm throwing these questions out to you to just really think about uh, uh, these questions before the person takes the job on. You could start that before they start uh, and definitely continue this, the conversation once they are there. Okay. So if at any time you have any questions, just jump in. I have no problems with that. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there is an organization uh, for chief diversity officers. Uh, I happen not to be a member uh, of this organization, um, but you can see that it, it's it's a, a well-respected organization. Um, a lot of schools are a part of it. Um, and so this is just something to just let you know that, uh, that this idea of chief diversity officer has evolved over time, um, has evolved a, a great, I mean, like you can't believe over the time that I've been in this position, how much the position has evolved how much people are using different terms. So some places you have people who uh, might be, you know, like I'm an associate vice president for institutional equity and diversity. Uh, and I think that Nadine at UNH is an associate and she's the chief diversity officer. So what does that mean about the scope of the work that we engage in um, that we have to think about having both of those titles are just one. So I just wanted to share this with you that there is a National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, a very active organization. The things that I want us to just think about also because uh, the, you know, the university isn't in isolation. Um, so there are a lot of things that we're influenced, what we can do, what whoever is your chief diversity officer, <laughs> whoever it will be, there are things that will influence that capacity to do some of the things uh, that they may feel like in the service of students and the people that they will be serving. Um, but it's not only the University of New Hampshire system, it's all of these other things uh, that will have an impact. So students will be ha have experiences within the community. Uh, I don't know about in Plymouth, but definitely here in Keene, uh, there are some experiences and then there are some experiences. And um, it's very important um, for me and my role to be an active participant in uh, the in 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 Keene, in the city of Keene, so I serve on a couple committees uh, because I know that by serving on those committees, those top, those city committees, that that work will have a direct impact on the students. So, when you think about your chief diversity officer, you have to realize that um, Wanda Mitchell once told me that uh, being a chief diversity officer is one of the best positions to have to prepare you to be a president. And I said, well, I'm not prepared to do that. So I'll just stay in my lane here. But, and, and, and mainly she was saying, because you have to be able to connect with so many different groups of people and be able to kind of uh, interact in a way that you're quote selling a product that they don't even know that they want. 
Um, and so she talked a lot about that. So that's why when I'm thinking about working in the community, uh, that's a very important piece. And so definitely working on uh, statewide in, in, um, initiatives and as well as some uh, national initiatives, because all those things will have an impact on our students. Uh, and we really do need to, to acknowledge that. So these are just some other questions. I'm full of questions that you would want to ask based on uh, just think, excuse me, everything is, it's possessed, I think. Um, so based on this, I just came up with these questions and I could definitely send them to Robin because we do have to think about all of these things as chief diversity officers about the, the, the culture in the US and, and how this higher ed culture, what is it? Uh, because that will help me as I'm thinking about ways to have an impact. Uh, I was telling some students earlier today that uh, I teach a course called Deconstructing the Academy to first year students. And I said, first you have to understand a system to be able to dismantle it. Um, so you have to have some working knowledge of how to dismantle it. So uh, we've been having a, a, a fun time reading uh, a fun time reading pedagogy of the press. Uh, it's blowing their heads up, but at the same time, this whole idea about now we understand the academy. So though, how do we how do we reshape it? How do we create it? So uh, as a chief diversity officer, I have to understand that as well. And and most of all, and something that we'll address just briefly, K through twelve education in the United States. Um, as as people in higher ed, we cannot ignore what's happening in K through twelve. We just we cannot. Um, so that's why it's so important for us to, to be aware of that. So I just want to share with you something about the state we work, play, and stay in, in case you're not aware. Um, I just want to share just a, a, a two-minute clip from the news. I think it was yesterday or day before. So you can understand why uh, I feel a sense of urgency and uh, an importance uh, for a chief diversity officer at higher ed in higher ed to be connected with what's happening in K through 12. So uh, ah, I have to stop sharing and then start sharing again. Can you see the, all righty. So I hope it, When you're launching a home oh, sorry about project, that. I thought I got you past that. Drive through lumber yards makes all the difference. At Bell Tate's Building Supply, you'll find could a be worse. Could be worse, Ed. Yeah, that's that. You need for <laughs> any project. Visit us at BellTates.com. Can you hear it okay? Republicans in Concord want to update an obscure Cold War era law on, quote, teachers' loyalty that bans educators from advocating for communism in schools. Back in 1949, everybody knew that communism was Karl Marx's improvement on socialism. So today we've lost that. Now reps are seeking to add to the existing loyalty statute prohibitions against teachers advocating for socialism or Marxism in the classroom. And their new legislation, House Bill 1255, goes further, saying, quote, no teacher shall advocate any doctrine or theory promoting a negative account or representation of the founding and history of the United States of America in New Hampshire public schools, which does not include the worldwide context of now outdated and discouraged practices. Such prohibition includes, but is not limited to, teaching that the United States was founded on racism. What we've gone through in terms of slavery and, and racism, and it, those are legitimate topics to talk about, but uh, saying that our country was founded on uh, the basis of slavery or that we were um, and still are a, uh, a racist country or state, um, I think is uh, not valid. Violations would trigger disciplinary sanctions. Advocates say that threat would have a chilling effect on the teaching of subjects that involve racism, like American slavery. We just need to have more conversations about these topics and understand each other rather than saying we can't have conversations about these topics. We spoke with a conservative member of the State Board of Education who opposes critical race theory, but believes this bill, as it's currently written, is too heavy handed. But it does continue a conversation of what is the thin line between censorship and um, protection? And what conversations can we have that acknowledge the steeped, really deep-rooted racism in our country, 
but also acknowledges that our country is a great place. In Concord, Adam Sexton. Yep. Okay, any reactions or reflections on that? And you might say, well, why are we talking about this? Well, it, it has everything to do with how we approach the work in higher ed. Any reactions? Uh, were people aware of this? Most people, everyone? Yeah, I have a reaction. Um, I felt my heart sinking. Mm -hmm. That was my emotional reaction. <laughs> and I, I remember something, um, we had Cache uh, come um, virtually, does anyone know, Ryan, when was that? I don't even know, two nights ago? I literally have no sense of the passage of time, but she, um, she talked about a bunch of this stuff and one of the students said, like, um, I think maybe it was yesterday because the student was saying, you know, I don't usually think about like being a woman mm -hmm. as, as, you know, part of my identity. It's not like right in the front of my mind all the time, but like with all the news going on with the abortion stuff and whatever. So I just feel like we're living in this moment where just every day we're getting assaulted um, based on these identities that are being so aggressively persecuted. And I see Mehdi has a hand up. I just wonder how much more uh, pressure it puts on us in higher ed mm -hmm. on so many levels. Um, yeah. 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 That was a conversation I had yesterday uh, with some people in our teacher education program um, because they're saying things like, so how do we prepare teachers to go out and do the work? in a state like this, because we don't know what to tell them about how to do it. So we were talking about brainstorming some ways that we could do it. So, you know, this is one of those things that as a chief diversity officer, you know, you'd have to be aware that it's happening because it's happening, like you said, a direct impact on our students, the students who are coming here to learn to be teachers. And then we sign off on them in May and they go into the teaching profession in New Hampshire, and they're like, oh my God, I can't even, what can I talk about? You know, so I think that it's it's this growing kind of, uh, and like I said to, to them as well, I said, it's, it's beyond just the legal piece at this point, uh, because there's enough anxiety and despair that people are staying away from the thing. So uh, staying away from a lot of topics. So as the chief diversity officer, how do that person, how does that person help uh, the institution navigate uh, that in order to provide, uh, you know, academic excellence. Because this is about academic excellence. When I'm teach, when you're teaching students about those kinds of things, you're, you're trying to make them be be prepared for the world and working it within the world. And so, uh, it, it raises the question about academic excellence. So a couple people I think have their hands. Yep, police and then Kathy. I feel drained. And I keep thinking uh, they must be intentional, bombarding us with so many. And I feel the need to prioritize. I have so much energy. and But every time I prioritize something, I feel like I am letting go something really important. I feel guilty at the same time. And I am incredibly concerned for the current and upcoming generation. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of the way that I, I and, and again, I live kind of in a fantasy world sometimes, but I'm, I'm feeling like, um, have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you know, you know you were losing? And so then you just go, well, F you. And then that's the end of the conversation. I feel like we're at that point where, um, people are taking desperate measures. That's a desperate measure by presenting that particular bill. Cause when I read, I was like, whoa, people are getting so desperate. So let's just keep putting the pressure on. Let's just keep talking about the things. Let's talk about them even more so now um, because 
uh, what's the next desperate measure? They're going to, it's going to really look. So I think that there's some hope uh, in, in, I know that that might sound a little Pollyanna, but I feel like there's some hope because people are having conversations about these topics who would have never done it even six months ago. Saying like, that sounds a little strange that they wanna go that far. Including, like I said, the person at the end of the tape, you heard what he said. And he's, he's, very, he's a very conservative person. And he's like, they went too far. They went way too far here. So I think that's my hope. But anyway, Kathy, and then we'll, we'll talk more. <laughs> I, I guess for me, my, my reaction to this is, you know, I'm teaching a first year course on disinformation right now. And this is, this throws me into despair because as a society, we're so bad at determining, you know, what's real, what's truth, what are facts and what's just outright lies. And this just feels like government outright lies. And, and so it's, it's, I don't know. I've been struggling with the disinformation piece with our first year students. And this just make, makes me feel like it's just going to continue to get worse. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I mean, we have these learning outcomes and our number one one is around critical thinking. And, and, and that's what we could do within higher ed is teach people. How, and that's a dangerous thing when you start teaching people to think. I mean, it's very dangerous, ask Socrates. But anyway, so we have to think about how do we do this? And, and as the chief diversity officer, how do you support that person in doing these things, in helping you do what Bell Hook says, call the question? Because you know we have in higher ed a little more leeway to call some of the questions. If you were in K through 12, it's a little harder to call some of those questions, but, but it's imperative. You know, and I'm so excited that you all are getting a chief development for yourself. It's like the perfect timing. It may not feel like it for you because you've been working on it for years. I know, I've heard about it. But at the same time, this is perfect timing because that person could come in and really help to you know, revolutionize how some of the things that you're already doing um, and, and then how do you support each other in the process of making sure that those things come to, to life? Because this is not just something that we're doing as an intellectual exercise. Um, this is not an intellectual exercise. <laughs> so, so let me just uh, put a couple of other things up. And again, we can definitely, so there's some 10 things I want you to consider. And uh, I tried to make them kind of, you know, anyway, entertaining. Uh, because uh, it's a Friday afternoon. So the first one is uh, the head and the lion of the mouth. Uh, because I think that oftentimes what happens uh, with the chief diversity officer, uh, people are saying, wait, 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 we can't go that fast. We can't do that that fast. What's, what's, what's the urgency about? Uh, what are the priorities? Who are, and, and then the diversity officer has to come back and say, who are we centering? Who are we centering in this situation? Because I think oftentimes the person with their, the head in the lion's mouth is saying, we don't have time to wait. My head is in this lion's mouth. Somebody needs to do something. So if we're centering the person with the head in the mouth, then there will be a different type of urgency as opposed to if we are centering those people who are sitting around. So you have to figure out what does that mean? And I think that one of the best ways you could support a chief diversity officer is to help articulate to the campus that this is such important work, it has to be a priority. I don't know how we're gonna do it together, but it has to be a priority. So I think that by recentering and thinking about that, and it's not just the people who are disenfranchised. When I think about uh, majority folks, when I think about white males, for example, I think about how important it is for us to uh, engage in certain activities uh, because when I do this work, I'm thinking about that work will help, quote, everyone. It's not just about helping a disenfranchised person to pull them up themselves up by the bootstraps, but it's about how do we not create conditions uh, that prevent them from having bootstraps in the first place. I have to address that as well. And so I think that we have to do this in a broad way as opposed to in a park. My other one is, uh, look in the room. Is that an elephant? No, it's a ghost. 
or am I going crazy? And I think that sometimes uh, the best thing that you could do for a chief diversity officer is confirm, especially if someone is coming from outside of the institution, that there are elephants in the room. You, you know the, the, the thing about the elephant in the room and it's knocking things over and nobody is saying anything, everybody's ignoring it. And if you're the only one seeing that elephant, you, you start to think I'm losing my mind. And then there are ghosts, there are things from the past that continue to have an impact that no one is not acknowledging. So I think that you know one of the best things that you could do is to support by confirming that there is an elephant in the room and there are ghosts in the room. And so how do we name those elephants and ghosts? Uh, the other thing that I wanna caution you on is afterthought inclusion. Um, and this happens quite often for chief diversity officers. And I'm not saying that anybody is intentionally being mean or anything like that, but this happens. So you have to be really thinking about it. It's almost like after everything has been, has been done, then it's like, oh, Dottie, can you give me some input? Can you look this over for me? Uh, and by then, it, it, it's a difficult situation to be in when you have to say to the person, wow, I understand what you're trying to do here. That, that's a great intention. And I find it very difficult because let me explain to you why. So I've had a couple of situations where that has occurred, uh, where the whole process had been gone through. And then at, as an afterthought, uh, someone will contact me and say, what do you think? And so it makes it really hard uh, to be the killjoy, so to speak. Uh, so as much as you can integrate our, uh, the, per, the, the chief diversity officer within a process because you want a co-creation. Uh, so if they could co-create with you, that's a good one. The next one is stay in your Jedi lane um, and that's justice and uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, so seeing the chief diversity officer as only someone who could weigh in on Jedi work, and I don't, I'm not sure how what Jedi work is, and not on um, the institutional wide work. And this can happen sometimes where uh, there are certain things that that might be happening. And um, I was, like I said, I was trained as a clinical psychologist, so there are certain things. And I did a lot of work before I um, became a, you know, did the diversity work specifically. I was, I, I've been a therapist uh, at counseling centers, university counseling centers at at at, at three. And so I know a little bit about that, you know, and so I've been on a university council, uh, campus. So oftentimes there's a hesitation that was past tense because I've been here long enough to kind of include or, uh, or, or if, if I would say something, you know, it would be like, no, you know, the implication would be stay in your diversity lane. Uh, understand that whoever you all are planning to hire uh, that they had a life before uh, they came to Plymouth, <laughs> and then they had a life, a, a professional life, probably uh, that, that 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 spans a scope of things that they could be very helpful for. The other one is the invisible person, which is related to that. Is that uh, sometimes what can happen when um, if you only if you quote thinking of the diversity person being in their lane, that that person might say something. And I know that a lot of people have had this experience where you say something and it gets downplayed and then someone else says it and it's this brilliant idea and they get the credit for it. So I think that it's really important to be mindful that sometimes uh, that can happen when a person feels a bit invisible when they're in this type of position. And uh, it's really important for you, if you're noticing it, uh, to uh, at least acknowledge that it, that that just occurred. Like, wow, I thought Susie had just said that, and now that Janie said it, it's a great. I wonder what's going on here. So there are a lot of process statements that you can make, and I think that that would be a great support because the potential uh, for someone coming in as a chief diversity officer to be kind of that invisible person uh, would is pretty great. Um, the other one is, hey, Miss Rosa Parks, uh, that sometimes when the going gets tough, Jedi work goes to the back of the bus. Uh, and I think that, again, I'm not saying that any of this is intentional. I'm only saying to you that this is a caution, that you wanna be mindful of when um, either uh, other things at the, at the university starts to bubble up and it becomes less of an, a priority and something else is more of a priority in quotes, that it gets shifted to the back of the bus, or if the heat gets on where uh, something happens and <laughs> gets put in the newspaper or something like that. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, is that we have to be really clear that uh, 
whatever we do, it may be quote tough, uh, but I always think about if it's tough for me, I can't imagine how much tougher it is for someone who's living the experience. Uh, so that's what keeps me really focused on, you know, I, I might be struggling or I might uh, get my, uh, <laughs> get a, a quote put on a website that I never said uh, and uh, get attributed to me. And it's a very negative quote. Uh, and, and, and that's minor compared to the experiences that some of our young people are having uh, in K through 12 uh, here in New Hampshire. So uh, on the campus, the same thing is that what you could do uh, to help support the chief diversity officer is to keep this work as a priority, is to keep the work as a priority. The other one is more personal for you, for those of, of you who will be working closer with this person. Uh, I can't be some of my best friends are. And it's just owning your stuff, especially if the, the chief diversity officer is a person of color who might challenge you and you see yourself as this liberal progressive white person. Uh, and it's almost like, why are you picking on me? You know, there's worse stuff going on there. So just some self-reflection. That would be one of the greatest things that you could do for a chief diversity officer is to own your stuff, to know your stuff, and then also to be willing to be challenged uh, to shift and to change and to grow. And a lot of times your ideal self and your real self are out of line and that can be very disturbing. Uh, I don't know about to you, but to me. The, the other thing is the way that uh, some of this work happens in, in higher ed, 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 it's like a square peg into an ever-changing uh, shaped a hole under a microscope. Uh, so this whole idea that sometimes uh, I've heard this comment made, we want a chief diversity officer, but, and then we need someone who can fit in, who really understands our system. So I think what's important to really grasp is what are your expectations for this person? You know, because that will have an impact on how you interpret their behavior. Because oftentimes people feel as though they are under a microscope. I know that I felt like I was under a microscope when I first came here because uh, just before I took the job, there was a, an article in the newspaper. Um, uh, there, was, there was going to be an article in the newspaper, excuse me, about uh, the position and why were they spending, the college spending so much money on a position, which they didn't know that that wasn't the case because they were about to publish a salary that I was like, damn, I would take that job. Uh, and luckily, a friend of mine who worked at the newspaper uh, mentioned to me that she was giving me a heads up that the article was going to come out and it wasn't a personal attack, uh, but it was just about the way that you know, the University of New Hampshire is investing money in an area that it doesn't need to. And then she said, and, um, you know, with that big salary. So I said, well, how much is my salary? I want to know. And when she told me, I was making half of what she told me. And I disclosed that to her, uh, that it was half. And she was like, oh my God. I said, yeah. I said, so I don't know what the hype is about. So uh, under a constant microscope, continue to be under a constant microscope. So you you might want, and, and this person will probably come in with enough savvy to know that that potential is there. So, um, you know, when I first got the job, I, I and I keep all of this information, um, got tons of um, messages from someone um, written and came through the mail, uh, which were kind of disturbing to to read. And, and even now, uh, Occasionally, the president will get uh, messages from different people saying, you know, that uh, I should be fired. It's a waste of money that that having a position like this creates more hatred and those kinds of things. So, again, the way that you can support a person is to be there for them, to uh, let them know that uh, you are there. And, and it's always good to have a, someone to just talk to uh, when those things happen. And so if you could just make yourself available uh, in that situation. The other one, this is my big one um, that uh, it takes a while, is this uh, let's develop a diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice plan without tying it to the overall plan for the institution. And so sometimes uh, the diversity plan is separate from uh, and, 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 you know, uh, so how do we integrate the two or how do we connect, have some type of uh, way to walk over uh, 
to each one and to uh, be able to tie them together. Um, because sometimes it is this, it feels like this separate but equal kind of thing uh, that we're gonna, oh yeah, let's do that plan. Why don't you do that plan? And then we'll do the real plan here. And then, um, you know, then you work on that. So it can't be that way uh, in so many ways. And, and I'm so excited that we are in the process of some strategic planning now and, and we are pulling together so many different pieces uh, and rooting it in, uh, a lot of the Jedi work. And so I'm very proud of that. And, and I know that. So, oh, I'm missing a slide. Hold on, hold on. My favorite one, I'm missing it. There was one, um, so I'll just tell you what it is uh, and I'll stop sharing. Um, beware of, um, get. we're gonna get Mikey to do it. I had, you remember Mikey? Oh man, I, lo I lost my slide and I had, I even had a little- We're all old here. So I guess <laughs> doing, I'm looking at Hannah. Hannah's like, I don't know who Mikey is. So there's a few people. Yeah, Ryan, there's people who don't know who Mikey is. And that's why I was planning to show the little video clip so you could see that these people, people didn't want to do some, yeah, life cereal. They didn't want to, you know, these little kids didn't want to do it. And they were like, hey, we don't, you know, we don't want to do it. Let's get Mikey to do it. So that's kind of like when I think about uh, this, this type of position, what ends up happening is, People breathe a sigh of relief. Phew, we have a diversity officer. And I, and I used to get teased. They were like, now that you're here, we don't have to do anything. Uh, you know, as a joke, ha, ha, ha. So I think that part of what we could do is really by supporting the chief diversity officer say, no, this is all of our work. Uh, and I had a quote, no wonder that slide got lost. Uh, there was a quote from, I don't know if you've, you've ever heard of Loretta Ross. Uh, she's the person who does a lot of uh, work related to call in culture as opposed to call out culture. And uh, she spoke here, uh, well, virtually uh, last semester. And one of the things she said was uh, when organizations call her in to work with them, she's an African American woman, the first thing she tells them, I am not your miracle Negro. So, so she's basically saying, if we're going to get any work done, we all have to do it because I'm, I'm not going to be doing it. And, and it was, well, to me, it was like one of the funniest things I ever heard. Uh, to other people, they were just kind of like, should we be laughing at that? I was like, yeah, because that's funny, you know, uh, because often that's what happens. We bring somebody in and, you know, we expect that. And again, it's not because anybody is mean spirited. That's not what I'm saying. But just be, consider that, be aware that that could potentially play out uh, within the university. So I just wanted to do pressured speech so we could have at least 15 minutes to talk. And I think I did it. So you, you did great. And um, <laughs> I kind of, I, I'm wondering what you all think, but I'm thinking of actually um, stopping the recording so that I can make this a little more public than we originally planned. Because honestly, I feel like the content that Dottie just shared with us really needs a wider audience. People need to see that. So if, if you're cool, um, anyone want to protest this plan of action? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks, um, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Dottie. You guys sit tight.